Greetings, everyone. Keith Parnell here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of In the Prog Seat. It's Tuesday night. We've got in the house Rick Labonte, Rand Kelly, and Sean Tonar. What's happening, everybody? How are you? Good evening. How are you doing, my friends? Yes, we got uh, half of us are representing tonight. I got my Candace on. Sean's got, I don't know what Sean has. On. Sean's got the, right. the black. Hey, nothing wrong with black. It's called Fat Heather <laughs> in the t shirt cool. business. <laughs> So today, I'm wearing my shirt proudly. Our love for Bill Bruford. All right. So one of the, uh, if you're a progressive rock fan, obviously he is one of the greatest drummers that ever lived, that ever played in this genre. He's also done a lot of uh, fusion stuff in his uh, career as well. So what we've done here is we've each picked. 10 of our favorite Bill Bruford performances. It could be a favorite album, could be songs, could be live album, could be whatever. We've got 10 choices. Uh, just this is all about our love for, for Bill Bruford has done so many great things over the years. And uh, we're going to start off with, we're going to go Rick, Rand, Sean, myself, and we're going to keep going all the way around till we get to our number one. So Rick, what do you got for number 10? Okay, well, there's a lot to choose from, as you know. And not only is he a guest, uh, in many albums, but he also been in two major great bands, and well, more than that, actually, and I'll get into that too. One of the things I wanted to comment, uh, but I learned that he only played one song on this uh, second note um, for uh, Genesis uh, and the, the cinema, uh, but if you get this album, just so people know, uh, Trick of the Tale, when you have a double CD, they play a live concert of 1976, where Bill worked with Phil Collins, and wow, it is a good performance. I wish that was available on disc for everybody to uh, hear all what he do. Most of the drumming when uh, Phil is stepping up to the microphone for the first time touring without Peter Gabriel. So that's not my 10th choice, but it was actually beaten way at the door. But I'm going to go with his first album with King Crimson. Uh, I think this was... Uh, a good introduction coming from a great band like Yes, uh, what a way uh, to make a mark. And uh, not to lay his tongue, uh, you have to appreciate that uh, Robert is bringing a, almost a whole new lineup. And they did find their footing pretty quick as this band evolved, evolved from album to album. So being number 10, I like to say this was one of the ones that I want to uh, bring attention to our viewers. If you haven't checked it out, this was his first mark in Kim Quinton. Classic album. Awesome. I saw that tour with Genesis, Rick, in Berkeley. Did you? Did you know was, Phil Collins' first fantastic. time he performed? Was in Ontario. He was uh, performing, um, um, I want to say, not London, but Guelph, Ontario. A very odd spot for concert. And that was his first time being a front man was in Ontario. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. All right, Rand, what do you got for number, your number 10 choice? Oh, man. The first time I heard this guy play was in Las Vegas. I was in the Air Force. <clears throat> and it was a song called Your Move. And I said, I called up the radio station because you could do that back in those days. k -Luck, And I said, uh, what was that band you played with that female singer? It was really good. I liked that a lot. And he goes, uh, there's no female singer. And yes, that's a guy. And I went, huh? <laughs> But anyways, to get to get right to it, I went down to the base exchange the next day and bought this. And it literally changed my life. I couldn't believe how good this was. To this day, the Yes album by Yes, for those that like to have that information, is so good and so timeless. And even when you listen to it now, even though it's 50 years old, it still sounds like it hasn't happened yet, like it's in the future. That's how much this music means to me. And I was hooked. And right after this came Fragile, and it, it just never stopped for me. But this, the drumming on this was so fantastic. Yours is no disgrace. I remember my jaw was just like through the whole thing. I just could not believe how good it was. And I listened to it over and over and over. And my roommate was going, you really like those guys, don't you? <laughs> and let me see, you said yes? Yes. Yes, <laughs> you <know>? yes. <laughs> and you know what's funny? You know that part about instant karma? 
and give peace a chance. I never heard that on, on my copy of the A track for some reason. And I always thought they were singing send an instant comment to me. So I'm singing this wrong for like a decade. And somebody said, it's not comment, it's karma. So it's a John Lennon connection there. <laughs> so <said>, oh, really? <laughs> Anyways, yeah, the Yes album. That's started my journey with Bill Brifford. There you go. I'm going to do more of a chronological thing than actually, because I like everything he does. I mean, I'm, this is my favorite drummer in the whole world for, the, for, for like all time. So I've been listening to a lot of Bill Brufford. Well, we know they could uh, believe your idea for the show. So and I've seen him four times. Nice. I got to see the Bruford band and I've seen him in Yes three times and uh, Anderson Bruford Wakeman now. Cool. Awesome. All right, Sean, what do you got? For me, you know, I just kind of singled out some performances, certain songs that I thought really showcased his drumming as it evolved over the years. And I think this is a great show to do. You know, Bill is one of the most articulate drummers in all of rock you know him and neil from rush were kind of in a class of another themselves where you could sit back and just listen to them wax philosophical about many different subjects you know so it's you know it's always Indeed. it's almost as fun to hear them talk as it is to hear them play sometimes uh for my number 10 i'm going to go with the stephen stills cover on time and a word of every days you know, I think there's some really aggressive, great playing from Bill and Chris on those first two Yes albums that got a little polished off down the road. Um, and yeah, yes, you know, you know the part like kind of about halfway through where it's like blah, 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 doo, 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 blah, 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 you know, and then it just takes off, you know, and that's, yeah, that's my favorite early Bill moment. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's a John Coltrane kind of like miles davis just falls out jazz it's just crazy yeah you've I seen the, the video where they went to belgium and did that kind of monkeys want to be show where a nun chases them through the park to that tune and then eventually yeah they wind up they're also the falling out of a dude dune buggy it's a wonder they didn't get killed yeah that's actually pretty cool footage i mean it's all lip sync but it, it you know it's just a, a rare chance to see that early lineup yeah i have all that i have like 18 uh, dvds of yes there's a lot of them out there. Oh, yeah. Collect them I all. everything. <laughs> I mean, he always brings this like great jazz sensibility to everything he does. And that kind of goes right in line with my number 10 choice here. Um, this is kind of an odd one, but I think he, his performance is great on here. And I just love the work he did on this album um, and the whole group. Uh, David Torn's Cloud About Mercury. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Take this out of the, um, yeah. So this is an all ECM, you know, release from 19, was this 87 or something like that. And uh, I'm a big David Torn fan. And, uh, you know, it, this is uh, Mark Isham, Tony Levin, Bill Bruford, and David Torn. And it's uh, it's jazzy. It's avant-garde. There's bits of rock on here. It's, I, 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 whether you call it prog or not, I don't know if I call it that, but uh, just these great looping guitars and these very kind of crimsonish moments, uh, but there's like a jazzy underpinning uh, that all throughout this album. And there's a, you know a bit of um, a bit of jamming on here, you know, like um, this, this interplay between the members, which really really great. And they kind of like like part two of this is that great uh, Bruford Levin upper extremities, which I was almost going to say that's tied for number 10 because that's awesome as well. But uh, some great stuff on here. Uh, Previous man is just totally awesome. Egg learns to walk. Great stuff. Yeah. There's yeah, that live performance blue. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. That's and, awesome. uh, my mind. <laughs> but I, I just, I love this album. I think it's just great. And I think this is like uh, one of those forgotten gems that he played on. And uh, I wish they did more of this stuff, you know, but at least we got that album. There's I've had that LP movie. since 1985. Pete. Never got it on CD though. No. Yeah. I've had it for a long time. When this originally come out, 1985 it was 85 okay cool great stuff all right back to rick I listen. yeah that basically what comes up to my next one upper extremities uh with tony i thought that was a great uh adventurous record i think you know uh it's just the one right they never made another 
one. They were just a one-off uh, album, right? Yeah, the one and, studio album and then the live album. That's that's. Yeah, so they never did it again, and it kind of reminds me what he did with UK. He did one album and takes off. Um, but uh, nevertheless, I, I think that's uh, that was worthy of mentioning, and that's my number nine. And I am going in order of my favorite of the album that he performed on, with a little nudge to his performance, right? I mean, there's a lot of great drumming examples that we're going to mention all through that. Uh, so, but that's where my number nine is. Cool. I love that album too. That's some, probably my favorite Crim related band that isn't King Crimson. Yeah, because it's got that feel to it, right? It totally sounds yes, like, it like Miles Davis jamming with 80s Crimson. Yeah. And uh, I love that comedy. That's a good, that's a good, uh, that's a good description. Not that Chris Bodie is Miles Davis, but he. No, no, but yeah. No, no, no. He's usually kind of known as the Kenny G of the trumpet. Yeah. And some people are kind of surprised to see him playing with these prog heavyweights, but he he can hang. They wouldn't have called him if he, you know, the right guy to do it. That's true. All right, Rand, what do you got? Uh, There's a little story with Cloud about Mercury. I saw this. Uh, VH1 New Visions show that you can't find anywhere. And I think I might have it on a VCR tape. Bill Burford hosted and he invited David Torn on. And, it's, and they were talking about doing that album. And uh, he admitted that to Bill that he lied about his resume and who he was, because Bill had no idea who he was. So he inflated his resume like he knew all these people that he knew Bill would know. And he got Bill to play on his album. And then he found out he lied. <laughs> <laughs> pretty clever Word. and bill goes uh, david goes and i lied and, and bill goes yeah you lied but it was like it was a happy thing you know and, and look at the blue thing happened and he must love the guy yeah so okay so god where to go next I, i'm still trying to make up my mind on these lower <laughs> ones first of all i think what i'll do is just throw these in and real quick and say phenomenal playing from bill bruford and this is his fastest music in ever like Sean was saying every days but also then and also um uh, astral, astral traveler, traveler. And, uh, no how do you say it no opportunity necessary no experience needed he's playing like a freight train that's just off the, with no with no captain you know it's like where is he but yeah so anyways that takes care of those you know so I can do these other ones I wanted to do this will be nine Oh, wow. Okay. Thanks. Him and Jeff Berlin and this uh, really hot guitar player out of Japan, Kazumi Watanabe. What a trio these guys do. They're so hot. But this is worth getting. I paid 65 bucks for this and it was like 15 years ago. So I don't know what it costs now. They're so hard to get. get. They're probably pretty hard to get now. And I have the CD too. They have a, a second one called The Spice of Life 2 with this like lobster coming out of the ocean. It almost looks like a Roger Dean cover. It might be, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, but, I don't um, think it is, but it does look like it, yeah. Yeah, it really does. It kind of reminds me of Gentle Giant Octopus in a way. Ooh. But the performance on that and, and, and the sound of that is just unbelievable. Whoever produced that just did a marvelous job. It's real clear. Have you, have, do you have that DVD? I don't. No. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's really awesome. It's probably on YouTube, I guess. But uh, don't know much about the tracks. It's been years since I heard it, but oh my God. It's a Japanese DVD out of Japan. And uh, yeah, the spice of, it's called The Spice of Live. Cool. Cool. My, my number nine. All right. My number nine is a little different. Um, I'm going to go with the Sheltering Sky from the Discipline album, King Crimson, mm-hmm. where Bill is playing no drums at all, and at least not in the traditional sense. He's playing the African slit drum, and that's really the basis of that song, what it's built upon. And uh, you know, leave it to Bill to try, you know, something like that. I, I think that's one of my favorite songs on that album as well. It's one of the few that seems more like it's improv based rather than you know planned in advance. Although I don't know, it might have been. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Killer song. Yeah, that's that's the one. Yes. I bought a guitar synthesizer and I was able to make that sound that Fripp uses on it. 
You know, that sound is long to find it. That sound is of its time. Um, the only guy that I think he still uses it is Pat Metheny. That horn it's, sound kind of became. It's a, yeah, it's a yeah. trumpet. It's a, yeah. it's a muted trumpet with a wiggle. Uh, <laughs> super fast rate. Definitely unique and of its time, like you said. That's uh, oh, Yeah, 81. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Well, it was they were pushing edge. the envelope. You know, it really was cutting edge back then. And um, yeah, and the, you well, had to play their guitar also. And they're actually really well built. You've seen the kind of brown, kind of looks like an SG, but it's not. It's a Roland. Yeah, the Roland guitar. Yeah. Yeah, get that uh, DVD called Neil and Jack and Maine. You get the whole I got one. it. Plus, you get the other one too live. It's worth it just to see Royce. Bruford play the Sheltering Sky live, just walking around the stage with, with that on the shoulder playing it, you know? And it's, that's really cool. Yeah. So, what's your number nine, Pete? My number nine is Kazumi Watanabe, The Spice of Life 2. Or Never two. heard of it. Is it good? Oh, it's with the lobster. I had it on cassette in the 80s, and yeah, I played that to cassette. death, and I have never been able to find that on CD. It oh is so God. good. It's, it's just, hard to find. I mean, Jeff Berlin and, and Kazumi is such a great guitar player. He's like kind of like, um, they, didn't they used to call him Rand? They, he was like the, the Japanese Alan Holdsworth. They, he had like a nickname, um, okay. just kind of like, you know, um, What's his face from Loudness was always uh, Akira Takasaki was always called the, the Japanese Eddie Van Halen, even though he said nothing like him. Well, Kazumi always had that kind of tag uh, with him. But a burning album, great fusion album. I mean, Jeff Berlin and Bruford and Kazumi, magic stuff. And I, I've been trying to track down that on CD for a million years. And I gave up like many years ago. But I, that's why I saw Rand pull out that DVD. I was like, oh, very cool. Someone else knows about that. So the... Uh... What did he call him? The Japanese what? I thought he they used to call Alan, him the Japanese Alan Holdsworth, I thought. Oh, yeah. He, he's really hot. This guy can play. Yep. And he's released like a right ton on. of albums. He's done like a bunch of acoustic albums, a lot of electric stuff, and well worth seeking out if you haven't uh, heard him before. It's uh, K-A-Z-U-M-I Watanabe, W-A-T-A-N-A-B-E. Uh, and for those of you... He's got a crap load of albums. Oh, right? a ton I mean, of them. A ton ridiculous. Of them. Yeah. I have a couple, but uh, he, has a, he has a couple of early live ones that I also had on cassette, which were just absolutely amazing. And he Can you see this? Yeah, that's the one. Yep, right there. It's got the Ooh. giant lobster on the front coming out of the water. Lobster coming out of the sea. <laughs> Was it a rock lobster? There's a silly lobster. Those two. That's, right? yeah. that, that, that segues into high knee, because that's, that's named for a band. Silly lobster. <laughs> She plays bass. Had enough of silly lobsters. Look around me and I see you didn't so. Oh no. <laughs> he was awesome. We traded email addresses. It's pretty cool. I'm sending her music she's never heard of. Hawkwind. Cool. Ah, well, Neve should be listening to Hawkwind. So. And Audrey yeah. Tentacles. Somebody suggested that she goes, never heard of either one. I go, what are you waiting for? <laughs> I know she loves her British bands, right? So, uh, yeah. That's right. I yeah. said, think, I said, Osric Tentacles, think Gong with Steve Hillage with no singer. That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, my eighth choice is still going in vain with, uh, or in line with um, Buddy Pete, with Bill, um, but I'm adding a couple of chains of personnel Dave Stewart, Alan Holdsworth, and of course, Jeff Berlin. And I love this record, one of a kind. Uh, Bruford, you gotta get it if you don't have it. It's uh, it's great. I, I, you know what? It's one of those albums that I can put them on, put it on at any given time. Whether I'm driving, doing chores, or I just want to mellow, or I want to brighten up with the sunrise or whatever, this is the album I put on. I like this very much. So uh, I was, it was one of the first go-to albums I went to when you guys brought up this subject matter, and uh, I knew it had to be in my top. 10 at least, but they could number eight for me. Yep. Great trick. Great choice. Awesome. We might be seeing that again at some point. I think. <laughs> there was there was a band in Eureka called the Fusion Band, and they love music like that. And I saw them at the bar. They literally opened with Hell's Bells. Really? Amazing. Very cool. It's like, I don't believe this is happening. <laughs> I'd fill up the tip bucket for that. Yeah, exactly. This, not this not is a town. This that. is a town that's mainly country western guys. <laughs> cool. All right, Rand, what do you got next? What do I got next? Oh god, where do I go? Ugh, this is getting tough. 
Well, I'll, I'll piggyback on, uh, you know how you're doing those uh, album things where you do like uh, the next best one after the big one? Classic well, album. I, I love the format. Here you go. This is this came out before one of a kind, yep. but it's actually mm -hmm. considered like I'm sure I got an ant crawling on my screen. But uh, <laughs> there's a first oh, for this man. channel, man. <laughs> oh, you get an there, insect right? off the screen. All righty then. I can't believe that happened. Anyways, uh, <laughs> this was this was unbelievable. We heard this and uh, <laughs> it came out right before UK, and it was like this was the was the the greatest album. I it's just like I love this stuff. There's stuff on here that's so good. Beelzebub starts out. Ruford's playing the vibraphone. And he is kicking ass. I think I can play. You know, it's like the dude in General Giant, Carrie Minier. And then you got back to the beginning with the vocalist uh, Nip Peacock and tunes that you never ever hear anybody talk about. If you can't stand the heat is insane. Uh, sample and hold is insane and Alan Haldris is just crazy on this album. I love one of a kind, I really do, but I think actually this is more my favorite and also it means more if it came first. So that's about all I got to say about feels good to me. Also, it's the only one that's called Bill Burford then they changed the yeah, name yeah. of the band to Burford. Yeah. So if you go looking for it, it's in a different spot usually. Okay. Yeah. That was eight, right? Uh, yep. I'll just save it some time yep. and say I echo Rand's thoughts for my number eight. Cool. I was going to pick out Beals above and point out his great mallet playing because I don't think people even realize it's Bill playing those sometimes. And, uh, you know, I hear he didn't really keep his chops up, but for a little window of time there in the late 70s, he could play some pretty killer stuff on the xylophone or marimba or whatever he chose to use yeah, so, yeah. yeah cool i think ruth stuff. underwood would, would be proud yeah ruth underwood was so I, good i think she'd dig it yeah. <laughs> so good so good yeah i'm gonna we're gonna do a whole round of bruford here so uh my number eight is one of kind uh which i absolutely love and i i opted to go with that over feels good to me i'm not crazy about annette's vocals on the album I know to some people that's kind of sacrilege. I, to me, it's like, I just want to hear the instrumental stuff. Come um, and get it. <laughs> but I do, I mean, that's a great album too. I mean, Feels Good to Me is awesome, but I, I like One of a Kind a little bit better. So that is my Thank number you. eight. I just, I love the four piece and uh, Man Holdsworth is just amazing on that album. The whole band is great. And yes. the compositions are terrific. And every guy in the band gets to shine, but it sounds like a true band which I really like. So that's my number eight. And I found out later on that the Sahara of Snow was really a UK song. Yeah, exactly. Right. That they wrote Eddie that. Eddie Johnson got credit and I'm going, why? Yeah. <laughs> yep. yep. Another they... weird thing about that album is that it says Jeff Berlin, bass and the vocals. And I'm listening to that going, where is Jeff Berlin? And then I bought Gradually Going Tornado and I said, oh, there he is. <laughs> I like his singing too. I'm one of the few people that do, but I really like him. Sounds like he likes Jack Bruce a lot. Yeah. Give it that. He's got it's he's got kind of he's a actually doing a tribute to Jack right now. Is he really? Well, yeah, I got an email about him we're doing a crowdfunding thing today for it. So, and he's got all Ooh, kinds I of I saw that. Stuff. Yeah, I didn't read the whole email. I saw that. Okay. Yeah, that's check out there's a list of like this long of, of star, you know, celebrity uh guests and such, many wow. of which we know and love. So cool. yeah, it could be kind of interesting. Yeah. Hey, why not? Also, I also used to think Berlin played fretless on those albums, and then I found out he doesn't. He never has a fretless ever anywhere. Hmm. So he makes sound. a fret bass sound like a fretless. Which yeah, I was gonna say that's a pretty cool trick in itself. I don't know how you do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did see I, I did get to watch him in live in 1980 with uh, the unknown John Clark, and they were phenomenal. My god, what wow. a cool. Very cool. Nice. Right, Rand, uh, Rick, what do you got? All right. For uh, Lucky Seven over here, right? Yeah. So, uh, well, I'm going to go with, and you know, no apologies. I mean, I'm going to be obvious. Uh, I do think I'm picking it in the 70s. And it's not that old, old preach everything, else, but most of it is in the 70s. And this one is 1975 uh, and helping out a, a, a former bandmate, Chris Squire, uh, Fish Out of Water. 
And unlike other albums, he like he played in Rick Wakeman's album, but he only played a, a couple of songs. He 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 was the drummer for the whole thing, you know. So start to finish, he would hire it, and uh, and uh, he did a fantastic uh, job. And I really liked this album. Uh, um, it was actually a late discovery for me uh, because by then I've had John Anderson, Steve Howe, Remedy, a few albums of individual, but I didn't have Chris Squire and he was the one of the last one again. I kind of like this album a lot. I was surprised how much, yes, it sounded, you know, uh, so uh, I really liked it. So they get my pick. And best, I love his performance on that. Best Yes member song, in my opinion. Yeah, I I concur. Yeah, yeah. I, when I heard that album, oh my god, we were just like, he's playing twelve string guitar on there, electric twelve string guitar. You can hear it in uh, silently falling, <clears throat> which is my favorite song on that album. I must have been with that one too because I've got it right here anyway. <laughs> right on. This one has a really cool DVD uh, interview with uh, John Kirkman from uh, Cruise to the Edge. But I gotta tell you something about this pressing. Uh, the sound of this, to me, of the regular album is terrible. I've got the Japanese copy and, and uh, it just blows this right out of the water. The regular one that you could buy with just the album only is 20 times better than this. They over, they vapor trailed it. You know what I mean, Pete? In my opinion, they vapor trailed Chris Squire's album. I don't like the way it sounds. It's way too hot. Mm. Just, mm. but yeah, it, you're right, uh, Rick. It, it was phenomenal. Well, when I saw the Yes Solos tour, they actually did hold out your hand. Great song. Great song. Oh yeah. wow! Well, I actually like the title because you know we know he had a song, the bass thing he did in Fragile, called Fish. And being fish out of water, you know, out of the out of the band, it's a great song title. I thought it was a well, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. He got really that cute. nickname. He got that nickname because he was always taking baths. He liked taking baths, so they called him <laughs> fish out of water when he wasn't in a bathtub. That's funny. So, so he just went with it when he did his album. But what a great band! Oh my God, Bill Burford, Patrick Mraz, Andrew Price Trackman. And have, yeah. have you ever heard yeah. the Sin? Have you heard the Sin, S Y N? That's where that guy came from. That guy that orchestrated all that stuff. That's a really good album, by the way. I have that too. But uh, that's an older album, and Bruford's not with them. They had, he had they hadn't formed Yes yet. It was Peter Banks and Chris Squire. But it's a, it's it's good stuff. It didn't get very popular though. No, oh, it's my turn. Huh? Okay. Ta da. Number seven, yes, songs. Rupert's only on three songs on this, actually, technically two, because long distance run around and the fish roll together. But we'll talk about that. You know, bass solo that Chris Squire does on here. Bill Burford's playing along with him through most of the whole thing. Uh, he's kicking ass, and he kicks ass on Perpetual Change. This is that uh, Japanese Microsonic CD release that came out. 19, I don't know, 99, I think. But anyways, I bought them all. Uh, Perpetual Change is really great. Bill Burford just kicks ass on that. And he does a drum solo, which is kind of rare for him to just play drums by himself. And he, he brings the band back in. So they don't really know when he's going to end. And you can hear him sort of going, and he just kind of rolls it in, you know. You can tell that band's going to come in, and they do, and they go, and it's done. And and that middle section where he's playing in like I don't know, 15, 16, or something, really strange. Half the band's in some other time, he's in another time, and they on the Yes album they actually separate it in the speakers, then they bring it back together, and you go, oh god, that's nuts. But uh, yeah, it's just, the guy's a genius, what can I say? I love him. That he is, that he is. All right, Sean, what do you got? Well, I was gonna pick Lucky Seven, but for the sake of variety, I'm gonna pick something else. And I'm gonna go with 5% for nothing off this little platter that we all love so much called Fragile. This is the uh, Roger Dean updated cover that 
I got that. Comes with the Stephen Wilson vinyl remixes. Kind of, kind of an interesting alternate take, like probably what he would have done back then if he had the uh, the a little stuff more vibrant. Do it, yeah. I much prefer the original one. cover. It's supposed to be purple, not black. Yeah, yeah. Me being picky, but five percent for nothing. I mean, it's only it's short. You know, there isn't much to it, but it really to me points to King Crimson. You know, the the riffs are all built around these little tritony kind of flatted fifth, dun, 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 you know, and that alone is very weird for Yes, because Yes has a very sunny harmonic vocabulary. They hardly ever get into, you know, this kind of, you know, this kind of King Crimson kind of. I mean, Yes just doesn't do that. That's not their thing. They're much happier than that. But, but yet. 5% for nothing is all about that. And uh, just rhythmically as well. And I think it kind of points to, to where Bill was heading in a year or two. Took the words right out of my mouth because uh, I was going to go with Fragile. Damn it, Keith. I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, but yeah, I mean, this definitely is the start of, I think, where he wanted to go. And uh, it, I know we've talked about this before. It's, it's, it's almost bizarre to think that Bill Bruford was bored in Yes, right? As crazy as that sounds and he wanted to go do something a little more adventurous and yeah i guess we could say king crimson was a little more adventurous a little more dangerous right and not as kind of meticulously crafted but uh yeah i mean there's some stuff great stuff on here heart of the sunrise and south side of the sky and i know we've all heard roundabout a million times but uh just some a really great piece of music i think here that uh lets the whole band you know get, get their little showcases which is kind of neat but uh had to be on this list somewhere and it's uh my number seven back to rick well i'm i'm going back to the yes and it's gonna happen because that's the dominant piece of work that i love is uh, and that's my one of my favorite lineups is this, this dream team up to, uh, especially closer to the edge. Uh, but time in a word, uh, the, I think it was a great adventurous album. Uh, I like the Astra, uh, Astra Traveler, a Prophet, Sweet Dreams. I love the way they approach it. And uh, yeah, and he keeps himself busy as much as he can. He looked, and then if he was bored, and yes, he tries to find something that fill in that gap or hope. And I thought, I, when I listened to it and I was paying attention to Bill's part, because I've been always listening to the whole band, but just do what it'd be like to be the, in the drummer's chair. Pretty creative stuff, even though they were basing around a song structure, uh, but he was allowed to shine and make some album room, just like Steve Howe does, and everybody does, to, to shine a little bit. And I think this was a great start for their career, being their second album. I, mean, I like the first album. But it didn't make it in my top ten. Uh, but time and word definitely does. It's in number six for me. There you go. Record. Rand, you're number six. This was the American cover because they wouldn't allow that one that uh, Rick just showed to go on the shelves in America. So Steve Howe is on the cover here, and on the back is Peter Banks. You talk about confusing people. Yeah, ridiculous. We were like, what the hell is going on? But that's not my number six. I just wanted to help Rick out. My number six is going to be. Ah, oof, yeah. King Crimson, The Great Deceiver. Four discs of absolute heaven. So, Rand, <laughs> this afternoon when you asked if we could do uh, live albums, and I said yes, I knew that was the reason why you asked. <laughs> yeah and another thing too, that's like a granddaddy of all king crimson live albums right there right? yeah i know and you know what i just i just found out something i bought this the road to red which i haven't heard anything off of it yet that's on there all four discs is on this wow this is gonna be awesome i can't wait but uh yeah i went crazy and got them all like i said except for heaven and earth i didn't can't find it under six, six or five hundred dollars everything is just like gone nuts so i can't do it uh but anyways uh yeah the great deceiver oh my god there's four discs here and they have a lot of improving that we didn't know about you know because we were getting like uh earthbound and usa as live albums and that really wasn't telling us a whole lot about what they were really capable of he would hit he being robert fripp he would hint at it was tunes like Providence and Starless and Bible Black on, on that album. 
you could tell that they were kind of like making it up as they go along and yeah. stuff like that. But there's tons of it on this album. Look at all these tunes. I don't know if you can see them. Four discs. That's right. And it's just phenomenal. And two discs and nothing but Lark's Tongue Part Two. <laughs> yeah, and Jamie Muir's on it, a lot of it too, but he did a lot of what you call incidental percussion. I don't think he's actually playing an actual drum set with King Crimson. And the video from the Beat Club in Germany shows him wandering mm -hmm. around hitting a big hunk of metal. like It looks like aluminum foil that's just been... I think he was calling some ducks also while he was at it. Duck calling, yeah. <laughs> percussion, I mean, you know, anything... To, is going but yeah, he looked pretty bizarre in that kind that, of yeah, he was the man I, I highly recommend the great deceiver box set if you can find it yeah that's a must if you're a prog fan you got to have that yeah or it, turn it your that, card is that six hours and hours of savagery yeah. on that yeah it's in the Are great book now? yeah that was uh yeah. yep number six yep sean what do you got Number six. Well, let's see here. I think I'm going to go with Waiting Man from King Crimson's Beat album. Mm. I think this is a good example of um, some interesting places that the album went that Discipline didn't. You know, a lot of people kind of say, oh, those last two records in the 80s are just a knockoff of Discipline, but they're not really. I mean, yeah, each one of them has songs with interlocking guitars, but not every song has that. And even the interlocking guitar songs aren't all the same. Um, but that particular song, you know, opens with the electric drums. He's playing the Simmons drums and then blue joins them and they get this kind of polyrhythmic thing going on there. And, uh, I just think that's a, a drumming highlight of eighties Bruford without a doubt. Yep. You know, I think yeah, he was some really, really good stuff great. on those two albums, the second and third albums from that uh, time period. I absolutely agree. Um, my number six, I decided to go with the one that started it all. I mean, this is just this is a dangerous place. Yeah, it really <laughs> is. I mean, this album is like so far ahead of its time, I think. And uh, it just signaled the arrival of a new King Crimson and uh, just as dangerous as the one before it, uh, but ready for the 80s. Right. I mean, some just man, some great stuff on here uh, in discipline. Elephant Talk, Frame by Frame, Thela Hunjinchi, uh, Mate Kudasai. I mean, all this stuff is just amazing music. And uh, some of Bruford's best playing ever, I think, on this album. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think that album hits the balance that we probably talked about before when we talked about King Crimson, where, you know, the coolest, most complete King Crimson albums have these really dexterous, kind of menacing instrumental things. Then they have a really nice ballad. And then there's usually one kind of funny song, which in this case would be Elephant Talk. Yep. So, you know, it really covers the bases in, in a way that I think the next two albums kind of deliberately didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all three of them are different. Yeah, they really are. are similarities because it's the same guys. But yeah, they all, every one of them are have like a different feel to them. Do and don't, right? Really, well, yeah. you know, beat is well named because there's a lot of almost dancey kind of beats on that record. You yeah. Know, Torian Tangier, you know, stuff like that. That's you know, almost kind of kind of makes you want to move, you know, in yeah. a good way. And there's plenty of like new wave flavors on those two albums. You oh, know, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, they use a lot of the electronic that was available. That's one thing about Bill. And all the fog rock stars of the 70s, in the 80s, they welcomed new technology and they wanted to put it out on their records, one of the first to do so. That's why I like it when you made that comment about Neil Peart or Neil Peart uh, being in a class of their own, because they did fan, uh, fancy having new percussion ideas besides using just the acoustic rock drums they did in the 70s, right? So Bill was open to that. I remember seeing some videos of them live and he was just playing, standing up all the time like he did in the Yes Union, but for King Crimson, where he stood sure. up and played all these, you know, he didn't sit down traditionally as drummers like Al White, Alan White, you know. Who, no, well, you yeah. know, that's almost dates back to Jamie Muir, the whole stand up and be a percussionist. You know, back at, when Jamie left, Bill got a rack. They hung behind him with all kinds of pieces of sheet metal and stuff to bang on. And that, right. 80, that 80s kit where he stood up is just an extension of that. He had all that kind of stuff sampled in it and lots of new sounds too. So, and yeah, Jamie, Jamie Muir definitely left a big mark, you know, even though he was only with the group a short time. Short time yeah, yeah. But it gave him the idea perhaps to carry on 
both of those uh, things. Yeah, almost like this extra percussion yeah. angle was an important part of the recipe by that point. And even when Jamie left, Bill kind of carried it on. You guys, the reason that uh, Bill was doing the Simmons drums is because he helped Dave Simmons invent them. Yeah. Well, so I he was think first it, to get them. It worked great on discipline. You know, that album was all about cutting edge technology, guitar synths, stick, yeah. electric drums, cutting edge. You know, I thought they were getting a little old by the time he got to ABWH. I didn't really enjoy hearing a shotgun cannon snare on Heart of the Sunrise or whatever. But, you know, in Crimson, it was perfect. Cool. Well, I'll continue with King Crimson and it's got to be red. Got to be in there. My, I love this record, folks. I really do. And uh, and I really think they really stood out as individuals, yet, yet a band at the same time. And so I think this was my number five. I had to be somewhere. And I think looking what I got ahead, yeah, that's sit there comfortably for me. Great record. All right, Rand, what do you got up your sleeve for number five? Okay, number five, I'm going to go with uh, Crimson Beat, King Crimson Beat, the, the middle of the sandwich. Um, there's a song on here that's just mind-frying. And if you could just listen to Bill Bripper by himself, it would probably be phenomenal. But there's so much going on in the tune. You can tell he's playing his butt off, but you really can't. You really can't bring out the part, you know, unless you had like a, a way to do it. But yeah, I love Neurotica. I just, I just love it. I wish it was ten minutes long, but yeah, this is a, this is a great, great, great. It's mostly underrated, I think. Now Martin Popoff, this is his favorite album. Yep. Uh, yeah. Period. Yeah. Of anybody, <laughs> but uh, it's not mine. But I do, I really do love what Bill does on that album, and it's. Uh, I told you the story before about how it, it just segues with the uh, movie Heartbeat. And that's worth finding if you can't find it. Star Sissy Spacek and Nick Nolte <laughs> and John Hurd. Cool. Neurotica, killer tune. Yes, indeed. Sean, what you number, got a killer uh, tune ready for your pick, I'm sure. Yeah, what number is this? Uh, number five. five. Number five. Oh, well, we were talking about Red earlier. I'm going to go with one more Red Nightmare from the Red album. You know, that's one of the Bruford drum showcases because that song has a lot of breaks that, you know, allow the drums to do something without anything in the way. And, uh, you know, of course, we've all heard the famous story about him finding a ratty old broken cymbal in the trash can at the studio and bringing it in. And there is no more famous broken cymbal in all of Progdom than that one right there. As a matter of fact, I can't think of any other broken symbol that gets such accolades, you know, because they usually sound like shit, but there's something amazing about the sound of this particular one. And we're still talking about it 40 years later down here. Yep. yep. So, um, yeah. And, you know, next to the title track, I think that's my favorite riffage on that album. You know, that down, 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 you know, yeah. killer, killer stuff. Yep. Lydian, <laughs> Lydian mode rules. Yeah. Well, I think that's all whole tone. Check it out. Well, well, Pete, he's talking you... about the first three notes, Sean. <laughs> so when you, you got that flat here? five, you do bum, that flat bum, five bum, up bum, the major third. Bum, 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 yeah. bum, bum, bum. Bananza. Must have been Bananza. cowboy crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the Yes album. I mean, uh, I actually, yeah. I'm one of those rare people that actually likes the Yes album a little bit better than Fragile. Um, I know a lot of people don't agree with me on that one, but that's okay. And uh, I just, uh, I love the songs on this. Bruford's playing is absolutely incredible. It's the first album with Steve Howe. Um, yeah, just a classic album. So many classic tunes on here. Um, Starship Trooper, of course. Yours is No Disgrace. Perpetual Change, so underrated. Uh, yes. You know, just, uh, you know, I, I, I never need to hear. I've seen all good people again. I've heard that a million times, but uh, just a really, really good album. Adventure is good as well, too. So that's my number five. You know, the best all good people is the one on the ABWH show where they take it and everybody solos at the end and they keep modulating. Yeah, and that is pretty good. That's the one from, uh, from California, right? Yeah, that's that's uh, like if you're sick of the other versions, check that out because they never did. But when it. you say modulating, I mean, is that transposing from one 
Yeah, exactly. Like there's a they wow. put a bunch of extra key changes in there that weren't in the original, and everybody in the band gets to solo, and they keep trading them back and forth, and it's just yeah, that's my favorite live version of that actually. You got to add something cool. different to it because yeah, on its own, man, it's like on its own it's like yeah here, here we go again and i'd like to point out if you get the stephen wilson remix they give you the uh original long version of adventure where steve howe gets to stretch and it is so cool because for years we went why did they stop and he's doing great and yeah, he's, right, right when he's ripping it up yeah right just as he's starting to go and he sounds like robert fripp they they cut it out well on the new stephen wilson remix it's all there baby and you can just relish it is it, it does it it's like does he keep ripping for another 30 seconds or no no it's it? about a minute and a half long hmm. i think let me see what's the running time on that i think they tell you maybe not uh -uh. i have to just find it and look it up but yeah i remember i remember it's on there i bought all those 5.1ers and the S album sounds really great in 5.1. Probably the best improvement. Yeah, I can imagine. Mix. But when uh, Pete I, mentioned that album, that's the first song I think of. I know it's the opening, but that's the first thing I always picture of that band. When I look at the album, that's the song that starts jumping out. Of, dun, 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 you know. And then there was, and when you watched the movie, when you said uh, Bonja, uh, what did you say? Bonanza? Bonanza. You said, Nick? Yeah, they said that on their on an interview one time, talking basically that they would take it. They used to jam out TV theme tunes, right? And they would jam and out the shadows and it, yes, yeah, and venture. Yeah. So they jammed this, and that's how that song evolved to be where it came. So it's kind yeah, of and no opportunity that one there when they do that. Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. That's a that's called Big Country, and that was a movie that was out in the fifties. Yep, huh. Western. Well, okay. Um, number four for me, it's gonna be the UK album. Um, you know, I, I love this record, and and in the me dead too. of night or by the light of day, you take your pick. They're all good showcases of the band, and it's just a, a, a unfortunately it's short lived. But I mean, I know we put out one of a kind, and wait, some album comes out out of, as a result of not doing a second album. But uh, I like this one a lot, and it had to be up there. Yep. Got to. Absolutely. My man Anthony Ferraro is celebrating right now. Yes. Yeah, he's doing a cartwheel somewhere. I go right on. Somebody mentioned, but he might be arguing that, hey, you put me in fourth place. <laughs> you know, be a little higher. we got to get some shirts to say, got Jobson. <laughs> I think that'd be great. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Surprise him. All right. Rand, Rand has pulled his disappearing act on us once again. There he is. Random acts of randomness. There's nobody on this channel that runs off camera. Anthony to Ferraro, I'm going I'm to make a statement. Anthony Ferrara, I love you, brother, but you are not the only Eddie Jobson freak. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Try to find this, folks. <laughs> Look at the size of that. Holy smokes. Yeah. It, this has wow. night after night with the full concert in 5.1 surround sound. Wow. It's so good. It also has all the other stuff. But uh, yeah, it was worth getting. I don't think you can touch this under eight hundred dollars right now. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I'm with uh, Rick. I'm gonna go with uh, my box that just fell over. Uh, the UK first album. I want you to know, I saw this band live in Sacramento. Of course, you did. <laughs> Open for Al Di Miola. They played forty five minutes. Did everything on this album. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then left. And Holdsworth was on the side of the stage on his white Charvel going, when, when, when can I go get my beer? You know, he just looked like he was just miserable and playing so great. I thought, this is the best guitar work I've ever heard. This is awesome. This blows soft machine out of the water. And he just looks like, I hate being here. I don't like this band. I, I'm just going to play. But he was so good. And I had a t-shirt. My grandmother, I lived with my grandmother, and I had a white t-shirt. And I asked her to, to put this emblem on the white t-shirt. And she was a seamstress, and she did it. So I walked into that concert with that thing going across my chest, 
And my friend Bill goes, we'll let you revel in your glory. And everybody's coming up, how did you get that? How did you get that? I go, my grandma made it for me. Grandma made it. <clears throat> Grandma's cool. UK was so great. I'm just like, oh. Man, so you saw Holdsworth. The one thing I was upset on. about, though, they didn't give you the lyrics to this, so you had to listen really, really, really close to figure out what he was saying. He, clear, he enunciates pretty clearly, though. You can, at least it's no, not like an do. REM album or something where he No, but in the beginning bar. of in, in the Dead of Night, I had no clue what he was singing about, or in Time to Kill. I was like, what? Well, Sorry. just when you wanted to make sure you have it, my version came from Japan, and they had all the Japan writing of all the of uh, the history and then at the very back of it showed the lyrics of the whole thing on there so uh, you got yeah the that's what yeah that's what i got the just just the just the credits oh okay, okay. I I got the lyrics you, so cool well, i'm it? sure i'm sure what you're holding rick is in my box set but i'm not going to take the time to look at it. well i had to um i had to pay decent money of import to get that this version but i did get it there's like 15 discs on that box set. You get all those shows wow. they did at Penn's Landing and all that stuff, remastered by Eddie and yeah, everything. So Ram, by the end of that concert, did you want to like throw your guitar in the garbage can after like seeing Holdsworth <laughs> and then Miola all in the same night on the same stage? I would have, that would have been over. I was, yeah, I was just like, well, actually I felt that when I heard Mob Vishnu Orchestra, I was like, okay, I'm done. Yeah. I was just learning how to play, right? And I heard uh, Dance of Maya, and I'm going, oh my gosh, <laughs> this, this guy is just, he's out there. Yeah, I mean, yeah Demiello was like, when he did Race with the Devil on Spanish Highway, we were just like, you know, but I still enjoyed Holdsworth more, even though he was miserable. We, we really, really loved him. So <laughs> glad to see UK, because that was a rare, rare, rare moment right there. We were lucky to get to go. We came down from Eureka to Sacramento, which is about a 300 mile drive. And just, oh, it's just absolute heaven. Cool. Wow. All right. Sure. Never, my jam is Nevermore from that, by the way. I love that tune. That's my favorite song. Yeah. It's... And, and they open with Alaska. I hope they, they do it backwards. They open with Alaska and then go right to Time to Kill. Yeah. Then they did in the, in, the, in the Dead of Night scene. Love that. Okay. Well, for my number four, is that what it is? Yes, yep. it is. I'm going to go with Sound Chaser. I thought it was one of Bill's more adventurous mid 70s foyers. Brother, just Bill's kidding, not on that kidding. song. <laughs> Although I often wondered, it's funny. It's funny he that, fooled me. He got me. It's funny oh, that I almost, I almost didn't. Tell oh him. my God! I was, I I was like, what? Oh, you got to know. That's right. Uh, you know, it's funny though that. It's funny that Bruford left because he thought Yes was getting predictable, and then they made two of the most whack albums in their career. I know, and it's right? like, wouldn't you have liked to have stuck around for those? Because they're it's not a far cry from some of the weird stuff you were doing with King Crimson. Yeah. And I think I even asked him that on his website once and he's like, Oh no, I really wouldn't have anything to offer. I can't see Bill doing revealing science of God. Sorry. Yeah. But so anyway, my number four is Asbury Park from USA. Ooh. My oh. battered, battered promotional copy from the mid seventies. Um, just the first crack of that snare draw, draws you in, you know, it's just like mm. there's something about this groove that I love. So, you know, and there's zillions of King Crimson improvs out there, but that's way at the top of the pile for me. Yeah, that's a great one. You know, some of them meander, but that one actually really gets to the point pretty quickly. You know, the road to red box is supposed to have the full Asbury Park and Providence. Okay. He edited those out for USA or that. I mean, that's interesting. Yeah. Where did he get a single record? For you know, all that you know, hey man, huh? You should be getting commission for all this. Here's a little plug here, a little bit of plug there. In the uh, Air Force, they in the Air Force they called me the Spock of Rock. <laughs> My midnight tonight Fripp's uh, website is gonna he's gonna get like fifty sales at least of that. Um, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we need to find a way to monetize this so it goes right into your bank account, Rand. There you go. <laughs> Or we support uh, rock fantasy. Yeah, somebody like that, we know. There you go. All right, my number four. <laughs> yeah, what a great album, right? Uh, my favorite prog supergroups of all time. Um, 
as much as I really like the follow up, I still remain loyal to the first album. It's weird how when you talk to people about UK, there's people who feel very strongly about one over the other. I mean, in, in mm. those cases, right? Um, I don't know. I just Holdsworth's on this one, so that's and Bruford's on this one. So that's for me, right. as much as I love Bozio, it's like I want to hear those other two guys, and I like Danger Money, but this album for me just absolutely rules and everybody's amazing on this and uh i wish this lineup stayed together longer but that was really, not to be you know i think that's the greatest prog rock album of the second half of the 70s yeah, yeah. i would agree with you on that yeah everybody else was dialing it back because under under album i mean uh album company pressure to be more commercial less prog and right. uk comes out and says this is what we're doing for our debut. Yes. Right. Kind of oblivious of <laughs> what whole genre is dying, on. but we're going to do this. Yeah. You know, meanwhile, their peers are all grappling with the oncoming 80s and punk and going, how can we make this work for us? And UK was insular. They're just like, here's a, this. It's got nothing to do with anything else. You know, I think it's actually a pretty good successor to King Crimson, probably more than a lot of other records, you know, because you had basically... Fripp was going to reboot King Crimson. He got together with Bruford and Jobson, and then he bowed out. And I think he even suggested Steve Hackett or somebody like that to come in. But in the end, it became Holdsworth. And um, yeah, and Wetton, yeah, Wetton was back in the fold too. I mean, it basically was going to be a reboot of King Crimson, but Fripp bowed out at the last minute and it became something else. Yeah. And it's just as well because I, I, got, some tri- I got some trivia for you guys. It was originally going to be John Wetton. Bill Bruford and Rick Wick. That was called the British Bulldog. Bulldog, yeah. And you know where I found that out? Right here. Oh, God, I haven't seen that in 30 years, man. I used to know somebody that had that. I met, yes, in 2001. Look at this. Yeah, that was the yes book back in the day. There weren't a lot of them. I got Tom Brislin to sign this, and he's not even a part of it. It It's probably put together before he's born. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a pretty rare book now, too. I understand. Hard sure. to find. Hmm. Okay. Well, it looks like we're getting three. down to the last three, eh? Yeah. Top three. Yeah. Uh, um, three. It, it kind of suits me to say that it's in this order. Uh, I can. I'm like Peter. I like this album a little bit more entirely than Fragile. Just that Fragile has a couple of near and dear songs to me. Heart in Sunrise and South Side of the, uh, the Sky that 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 brings it up um, uh, that you know peg of a point of if you will. But this is a great album. I remember when I got it as a kid. I got it as a cassette, okay. And I got it at one of those you know drug stores that sell those cassette bins on your way out. And I just threw it in my Walkman back in the you know because like I would say eighty seven. So uh, it was like my well, last years of having cassettes and albums because I would go to CD. And, uh, but I remember listening to this album and saying how creative these guys are. And I couldn't tell what one song, if they blend into another song because everything was so fluid. I really liked that. And I became an instant Yes fan right off the bat. And then I didn't know that that's the same band that did Owner of the Lonely Heart. And that's the same band that did uh, roundabout, which I discovered, I heard them before. I just never heard an album from start to finish was the Yes album. That was the first time I heard it from you know side A to side B, into no interruption, and I was hooked. And I, as a as a kid, I was like, "Wow, this band, where you been all this time? How come I don't already have you in my collection?" So this was a really a uh, ground shaking album for me for this band. Yes, Changed my life, Rick. Overnight, yeah. it was just like unbelievable. I all I wanted to do was learn Steve Howe, and I did. I did learn a lot. Yeah, that was. Well, I felt like for some me. of the things they did. I just felt like some of the things they did in one song. People put all that work in an album, you know. Like there's a lot of detail, and I was really about that. And and I just liked to how. And I wasn't one of those people with a, a short attention span. I have to have the song in four minutes. The, when I looked at it and saw, oh my god, this song's like eleven minutes. I'm already interested to see where they're going to take me for the next 10 minutes. That was a different um, welcoming map for bands that, you know, how everybody like, don't bore, bring it to the chorus kind of thing. This wasn't like that for me, and I loved it because of that. That's what I respected about that album. You know what's great about that album? And Bill Burford would test to this too. 
he said that uh, Steve Howe has always sounded like Wes Montgomery on that album, particularly, especially in the solo of Perpetual Change. And that would turn people on to Wes Montgomery. And I highly recommend people listen to him. That dude played with one thumb, yeah. just pulling his thumb down the string. And he's going, I, I can't even imagine how he's doing that. But I've seen him do it on, on YouTube. It's phenomenal watching that guy play. He makes it look so easy. And then he's, I try. It's he's, all about, he's all about those octaves. Yeah, right. Those are, yeah, they're called double stuffs, I think. What? Uh, well, or, Octaves, yeah. Yeah, you know. Definitely I mean, good at that, yeah. yeah That's that, why they invented the Octavator, because no, nobody can do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's people that do it really well. well that was like the earliest Jimi picture. Hendrix does it a lot. Yeah, you know, you hear that on the end of Purple Haze, that kind of... Exactly, yeah. Uh, Villanova yeah. Junction, exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah. That was like early pitch shifting. That was the first time I heard it, too, when I saw the Woodstock movie. I went, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's a cool sound. Yeah. All right, Rand, what my you got? Okay. Three, yes. Yeah, I'm going to go off topic for just a second because we we're talking about this band so much. If you guys ever get a chance to see the Japanese release of this, look what you get. Mm. The regular album doesn't even open up. So I just wanted to tell people that was available. That looks nice. Oh. A nice picture of a, it's, a, it's not a live shot, it's just a stage thing with their instruments and stuff. But anyway, what do I got next? Oh, geez, I'm just losing it here. What do we got? Are we on three? Three, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I kind of blew it uh, when I did. Uh, oh, forgot about this. Uh -huh. Tapes. Yep, this is good. I have the LP and the CD. I think the CD is, is a little harsher sounding than the LP for some reason, but this is great. This is a, a radio show that they did from a place called My Father's Place in New York. And um, this is just great. It's got Hell's Bells, Sample and Hold, Painting of Coils, Travels with Myself, Bales Above, The Sahara of Snow, uh, Sweet and One of a Kind, Part Two, and 5G Ends the Night. But yeah, this is, this is definitely worth getting. I don't know how hard it is to find now. This was the tour I saw with the unknown John Clark. Uh, that's him right there, that bald dude. That bald dude right there. He was recommended by Alan Haldsworth to replace him. And he had a Gibson Les Paul with no whammy. And when you listen to that, you swear to God, he had a whammy bar. Yeah, he was just Sink, slinky strings, I think. Very slinky. Just, yeah, eights. And, and, and just... He was kick ass. And at the end of the show, this is funny. At the end of the show, him and Berlin traded instruments. But Berlin's playing his Les Paul. And John Clark's got this big PB bass or whatever it was at the time. And he's just looking at it going, what do I do with this? <laughs> he just didn't do anything. He just stood there and Stuart and Rupert and uh, Berlin were just jamming out. And uh, John Clark was like, oh, maybe I'll try a note here or there. Obviously, he never had a bass in his hand before. It's, I don't think they expected to do it, but I don't know who I knew it was. But it was funny to watch. A band called Timmy opened for him, and they were really, really progressive. They were like a super prog six. And I just fell in love with those guys, but you can't find their music anywhere. Tim, oh, huh? With a name like Timmy? Yeah, T I M M Y. Yeah. And then I go to look for them, and they were produced by. Eddie offered, but they gave up their prog. They started doing like pop. So it's not even worth finding what they were doing. All right, Sean, back to you. Number three. All right. Um, I'm going to go with the tune called Original Sin that was on um, Upper Extremities. I really love that album. As I mentioned, that's my favorite Crimson related album that's outside of Crimson. And um, that tune actually showed up later in, in his band Earthworks. I don't know if you guys are hip to any of his stuff with them. I, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, it's, it's, so it's not really on my list, but I think it's worth checking out, especially if you're interested in Bill's jazzier side. You know, that's when he finally got to just cut the shit and play some jazz. And if you like that kind of stuff, then um, the later albums from Earthworks 
are the more jazzy ones. Like the early ones are all about electric drums and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. it's it's definitely two distinct phases, but yeah, it's worth checking out. And I think, you know, he's some of his best playing is in that era. Yeah, that Footloose and Fancy Free DVD is is excellent. I highly suggest that. Yeah, I'm not a big fan, but I did want this. Yeah, it's I not love, my favorite era. He's either, acoustic. But... He plays acoustic on all this, right? Yeah, it's just nice to see him get back to some sort of subtlety because it, that all yeah. went out the window when he was beating the shit out of those Simmons drums for 15 years. And he even admitted it when I interviewed him, God, maybe 15 years ago. It's like, you know, he's like, it took me years to get my dynamics back because those old things weren't touch sensitive and you just had to whack them in order to get any sound out of them at all. And a lot of his ability to play dynamically just kind of went out the window for a number of years. So, but he did chords with them and stuff. He did things with the Simmons. Yeah, it's that like he's playing them more like a vibes or marimba or something. Exactly. You know, it wasn't, yeah. you know, he could sample tones and, and play these <laughs> primitive little melodies. I find the but earth. He was, you know, he wasn't the first to do that. I mean, you know, Carl Palmer and not only that, Alan White on Tales from Top of the People don't even realize that, that that's him playing a drum synthesizer mm -hmm. in uh, the ancient. I mean, the ritual, excuse me. So what were you saying about your thoughts on Earthworks, Pete? I, I find the Earthworks material, much of it, a little unapproachable. I just don't enjoy it. There's something about it. I, and I love jazz. Um, something about that band just never really sat well with me. I don't dislike it. It just doesn't move me much. That's why I just bought that one DVD. Yeah, that's I just wanted to watch him play. And there's very few things where you can watch Bill play, you know, as yeah. far as watching yeah. but I, I i'm with you pete i mean I, i've tried a lot of the earthworks and stuff and so too. far <laughs> that i've noticed the only one that really moved me much was called a part and yet a part that's pretty hot but the rest of them are kind of lame hmm. i think yeah and it's, i don't think there's a lot for prog fans to latch on to in that stuff but, uh, yeah and i'm not so sure a jazzer would appreciate it either because he probably seems like a bit of an interloper in the jazz world yeah so it's kind of neither you know well that's why i made that comment because i like a lot of jazz stuff and to me that just it just doesn't do a lot for me it's like it's not really there it's not really here it's not really there it just kind of sits in this weird kind of like earthworks root for jazz yeah, exactly. it's kind of yeah, own world. doesn't really work for me i don't know it's whatever yeah he said that that earthworks thing came from there was a big scene in 86 85 up north which is, was one of the tunes that scotland jazz acoustic that's where you all put it all all together that was we who he, who he brought the musicians in and decided to create the band and I think a lot of Yes fans just went, this ain't for me. I, I'm with you, yeah. Pete. I'm not a big fan. I don't own any Earthworks other than that DVD or this DVD. Well, there are fans out there that love it, you know. So yeah, there definitely is. They're very passionate about it, but it's some quality music. It just might not float your boat if you're more into proggy kind of stuff. But, you know, I'd say at least check it out, you know. Yeah, you got to be in the mood for it, too. I mean, I'm... <laughs> I'm not a, a John Coltrane fan, but I could listen to him if somebody put it on and I didn't want to be rude, I, I would listen to it, but I, I, I won't go out of my way to listen to the guy. So Pete, what's your number two, number three? Three, Lux Tongues and Axpick. Um, yeah, great album, Ruford's first with the band. I mean, geez, the two title tracks, right? The both parts that bookend the album are legendary. Book of Saturday, Easy Money, The Talking Drum. I mean, there's just some amazing playing on here from everybody included. And uh, I think Bru Bruford was really trying to make a statement with this band after leaving, you know, who he left, right? And I definitely think he got his foot in the door real quickly here. And uh, there's just some savage playing on here. There's some really kind of atmospheric, meditative stuff going on here. There's little bits of jazzy things here. It's just wonderful album. Great tricky rhythms. Lots of big riffs. Um, great stuff. To quote Fripp, I think you're about ready now, Bill. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're ready for us. Yep. Yeah. Right. The talking uh, drum. The talking drum segueing into Lark's Tongues and Ask Part Two is just. Phenomenal. yeah it's brilliant thousand yeah. screeching weasels yeah you know there's a little story about that part two song it was in a movie that i saw in sacramento 
And I heard that music and I go, I don't know what that is. I've heard that. And I and I went out of there and I went to Tower Records and I went, I just heard King Crimson in a movie that I saw called Emmanuel. And uh, and uh, I wanted to find that album and I bought the wrong album. I bought Red and I put it in my trip in my Volkswagen bus and was listening to Red and I went, no, this isn't it. And I went back in and got Lark's Tongues and Aspic and found it. Was this hopefully, you didn't, hopefully you didn't return the Red album, you know? Hopefully you I actually, I actually did because I, I only had so much money. I, it was like $2.98, man. I mean, it was... <laughs> and then three weeks later, he went and rebought it again. <laughs> it would have broke me. Oh, by the way, uh, it's not my turn, is it? You uh, spent all your money at the softcore cinema before you... I was just going to say... I was just going to say Fripp got really mad about that. He sued that that company for taking his music. Absolutely. And he was really mad about what they were doing with it because it was during a very naughty scene. Hmm. Too funny. All right, Rick, you're number two. All right, well, I kind of hinted at uh, with the flip toss in the coin, but Roger will be the next one. And, <laughs> and mainly about the timekeeping, how did the sun rise? All that time signature stuff. And bringing in dynamics and bombastic and then soft and back and forth. That's a high, that, just, just that song alone shows you what a great drummer is. I mean, they could be for the click track, guys, right? You know uh, what I'm talking about, Sean. Mm -hmm. Today, modern world, they always got everything on the click track so everybody can cut and paste or get in there or find their spot. These guys did it with real, the real tapes and, and, and go on long segments like this one. Uh, without losing that original tempo feel. It takes a lot of skill. And that's one thing I was really impressed about, the timekeeping. Because I even did it. I went test it. We're the beginning and then here the end. And it's almost in sync. Though that's not human. You know, human, we will stress and the ebb and flow will make you go a little faster depending on, the, you know, the passion. And that's but a good they thing. Pretty rough. Yeah. And it is a good thing, but this guy, they were really tight. That, that's what I was impressed about it. Um, and just like my heroes rush, I mean, it was that kind of uh, impression I got. When you listen to Roundabout or South Side of the Sky, all those changes, everything seemed to fit. That's a lot for a drummer to take in. And I don't envy Alan White when he had to pull off a tour. What was it? Like a weekend or something like that. You had to learn those albums and start going live right off the bat. That is like, at least Bill created this so he can memorize it to go on live. So it's a lot of thought process here. And uh, and so, yeah, that's why I picked that. Definitely one of the best uh, if he's a career. Absolutely. Oh, we, got, we got another one. I saw, I have eight versions of this album. I, I Chris Allowed. <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> I pulled the Chris Allowed and bought eight versions of this album. And I still, to this day, oh, you know what happened? I bought the Blu-ray that Stephen Wilson did and I couldn't get it to play in my player. I had to, I had to return it and get a DVD. I don't know why it wouldn't play. But anyways, I digress. Th this album is so good. And it came with a nice little booklet. Sorry, still have. Yeah, cool. Cool. Have you seen this book that Steve Howe's got? Like every guitar. I like that, the, the circle of guitars he has. Circle of guitars. The circle of six. <laughs> yep. Yeah, hold it steady now. You're making me seasick. I'm sorry. Let me try it this one. There's Rick. There, there you go. Now, Very cool. Now. Yep. And that was he probably has a hundred more besides uh, that. And, and it shows pictures of Chris Squire uh, doing something on a Reebok tape deck. But anyways, uh, well, get this in the hole. I'm nervous. I don't know why I get nervous. I love your show, Pete. I'm so glad to be here. And thanks for doing that, my idea. Anyways, yeah, Fragile is really special. I got to see the band live March 19th, 1972 in Las Vegas. They opened, well, they didn't open. There was a band called Wild Turkey. I'm sure Pete knows well about them. Love Wild oh, Turkey. Battle, <laughs> Battle Hymns. Glenn Cornick's band. Glenn yep. Cornick on yeah, bass. That's it. Gary Pickford Hopkins on lead vocal. And now I know why Rick 
Wakeman picked him to sing on Journey to the Center of the Earth. Yeah. They were touring together and they had become friends. Plus, Yes comes out with Bill Bruford. And, and I thought, still at that time, I thought that uh, there was a girl in the band. I don't know why I thought that. But anyways, Rick Wakeman had all this hair and he was wearing a red lame vest. He hadn't done the capes yet, but he looked really cool on stage and he's swinging his hair like this and it's just going <laughs> back and forth, this big swinging hair thing. And they were just phenomenal. They, they played all the great songs and they closed the night with Roundabout. And I did a review on Forgotten Yesterdays about the show. They leave and Black Sabbath comes out. It was the first time I'd ever seen Black Sabbath and they were doing the to uh, the uh, Master Reality Tour, which is my favorite Black Sabbath album. Wow. And, and it's just like, you know, after Yes, Ozzy comes out and Iron Man. It's just so weird. The energy was just, and people were just like, <sighs> after Yes, like such a lifting experience with those guys. And then Black Sabbath was just, <clears throat> you know, they were great. I, I love Black Sabbath. I do. Did the audience seem to love them both equally or were they kind of like... Most of the audience had no clue who Yes was and then when they were done, they were like, holy shit. Okay, because I, you know, I've heard when I was chatting with Derek Shulman, he talked about opening for Sabbath and it didn't go well at all. I mean, they're at the Hollywood no. Bowl and somebody hucks a cherry bomb on stage right in the middle of a right. solo and they're like... They did a little cussing like, you know, who's the bleep that did that, you know? Right. So, and I know, did see surprised I that did. the Sabbath audience would just shut up and listen to yes, you know. Sabbath fans are not very good with opening bands, and that has that's throughout their career. Well, yes wasn't very kind to General Giant, to tell you the truth. Uh, when I saw General Giant open to yes, I found out later that they didn't even allow General Giant to do a sound check. And Derek might have said that. Yeah. But uh, General Giant didn't need one. They yeah. were, <laughs> to me, they're the best band I've ever seen in my life. But uh, yeah, the, the Wild Turkey, yes, Black Sabbath concert, it goes down in history in my life is one of the, my greatest experiences ever. I just was so happy seeing yes for that. I think they played for about 45 hour, something like that. That just seemed like, it was just like I was in a bliss, a, 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 just a yes haze sort of thing. It was so good. I had no clue Bruford was gonna leave, but that was real shocking actually to find out yes songs had it. Alan White all over the place. And I bought the Yes Songs, Yes Songs, the movie on VCR. We saw it actually, but you know, Bruford wasn't in it. We thought Bruford was gonna be in it, but he wasn't. It was kind of disappointing. All righty, well, my Thanks, number two, I'm gonna go back to Fragile. Um, Heart of the Sunrise is you know, obviously the, the pinnacle moment on this record, I think, <laughs> but south side of the sky is one we haven't mentioned yet and it's equally compelling in its own way and it has that incredible drum intro that's just you know it's like, godly like bill bruford just signing his name right up front on that song you know <laughs> and the wind that they play before that is real just a little bit of lightning storm and thunder and stuff and so, then he comes in with the drums. Oh, yeah. so yeah that's my number two and they didn't Great play choice. it for years they didn't play that song for decades i never saw that live until the middle section gave them trouble i heard a relayer boot where they played everything but the middle section but they only did it a couple times and um i don't know why it's like it's just a lot of vocal harmonies i think they could have done it then but they just never did but um and but then boy, it became a was, staple in 2003 oh yeah that was a well they they did a lot of polls you know what song do you want to hear yes do and that was like at the top of every list for years yeah and I think they really enjoyed it once they dusted it off because it was like, oh, we haven't played this a million times. This is fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember the first time I saw them play that, I was like, wow, how cool is this, right? Yeah, After I'd already yeah seen me too. 10 times, I was like, whew, finally. Yeah, and then they added that yeah. at the end where Rick and Steve traded solos for about five minutes. And then later, Jeff, I, I think I've seen that being, being played now about five times. Well, with 35 uh, year anniversary party, the song I saw him do that. Yeah, yeah, that's when they did that. And I was blown away. But, and then, you know, um, they did it with justice too. It sounded just like the record, all the that piano bit there. Wow, I was impressed. 
Maybe yeah. it was, uh, again, it's uh, hard to pull off on stage back in that time, but technology today makes it so much easier. Even ask Jeff Lynch, he's happy. Some of the things that he, the nightmare he went through with ELO in the 70s, you can't get that sound on the stage like he can do it today. Yeah. So, Everybody uh, needs in-ear monitors, you know. That's yeah. what it boils down to. Playing a stringed instrument in front of a loud rock band, it, you know, you could be hung out to dry real quick if you got a bad mix or can't hear mm -hmm. yourself. You know, same with the acoustic piano. If they didn't have electric piano, they would never compete with the amp. Yeah. Yep. Okay. My number two gotta go with red. As Mr. George Lemie says, no softies here. Uh, this is just um, one killer track after another. Pretty heavy album in spots, delicate in others. I mean, the title track is amazing. Starless is one of the most gorgeous songs of all time. You know, Sean mentioned One More Red Nightmare. Absolutely great. Fallen Angel, beautiful. The awesomely atmospheric provenance, oh, just great, great stuff. Uh, and, you know, the power, the power trio to end all power trios right here, right? So uh, that's my number two. Love, love Red to death. Um, would have been my number one, except for my number one's got to be my number one. Uh, Nobody has mentioned the number one yet, so I have a feeling that uh, <laughs> we're all going to kind of draw from it at some point uh, on this number one, right? So, Yeah, and that is it. The drum roll, please. I'm going to surprise you. Closer to the edge, of course. I mean, just like Pete, it's, a, it's my favorite album from uh, yes. Yeah. And if you guys remember, um, we, uh, we did uh, a show about the uh, Frog Epic. And that was my number one in the first part of uh, because Close to the Edge is just so amazing. But I just love all that time signature stuff, all the ups and downs, the dynamics in this album, the ebb and flow, as I always say about this. Um, you know, even and you and I, he found a way to make, be relevant in a song that's based around acoustic and some keyboard. He just, it just sounds so great. Sounds so big when he hits the, the floor time to build the ending of that song. But then you got the third track, which is really busy and a drummer challenge, no question. But, um, but to imagine playing this live and to memorize all this stuff, all what's coming, uh, that, that takes some really talent. And I, I, I don't know. I know that they didn't write it down on paper and play along like an orchestra budget. They did it all from memory. And, uh, and so I don't know where you would get bored from a band like this, but this was a great way. If you're going to leave, yes, this is like, you know, a swan song moment because it's a great album. And they had a hard time beating it since then. But, uh, but anyway, that's my number one. Uh, sorry to be long-winded, but I can't help but show the enthusiasm Close to the Edge is just so uh, perfect frog record. And to do it in three songs, that's amazing. If you read, if you read uh, Bill's autobiography, he goes into great length how the creation of the, of the title track drove him nuts in the studio because they spent forever piecing together all these little bits into this one big long song. And I think that's the reason why he got fed up with Yes is because he just, in the studio, they spent way too much time on stuff. Whereas a lot of the King Crimson uh, recordings were closer to improvs than anything that Yes ever did. Sure, they just that's did right. it. It was in the moment, you know. The yeah. yes one. I mean, I can imagine him waiting through them, waiting through twenty minutes of close to the edge, and then it's like, hey, for the next record, we're going to do four of those, and he's like, <laughs> I'm out of here. No, nope, that's going to happen. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, especially the next album. But you know, it's also because of uh, they were so democratic to the fault, to the point that yeah, they I mean, were tired of something. Okay, we want to modulate to one octave uh, or one semitone. Can we vote for this? I think we should go with B minor. Well, why do you feel that way? And they will go on for an hour. This is and the true. drummer just like, make up your mind. I want to play. I get yeah. that. I can understand how frustrated. But to Rick Wakeman or to Steve Howe, the, the magicianship, they want to make sense of what they're doing too, probably. They come from a school of classical music. So that must be, uh, you know... Um, as uh, something that's always uh, kind of keeping them disciplined. Well, it shouldn't make sense if I'm going to A minor, where, you know, in this 70s psychedelic allow you to do anything and prog rock do allow you to be free form art. And, but for Bill, I might've been tired some just to watch him make a decision that takes so long. 
and it doesn't apply to you. That's probably why, you know. Sure. I mean, they get props for being democratic and letting everybody get their bid in, but boy, That's right. it's a long time to do it, you know. Mm. <laughs> it's so much easier when one guy writes and says, "Here it is, ice the cake," you yeah. know, rather than we're going to build the cake piece by piece, <laughs> crumb by crumb. You know? Exactly. It's easy when. Robert Fripp said, okay, the tape is rolling. Just try to do right, it. Right, right here we go. Right. I <laughs> my piece, here we go. So, yeah, I can, I can understand B Bruford's frustrations, you know, yeah. but the, the results speak for themselves, you know, greatest album in progressive rock, basically. Pretty much. It, for me, it's the greatest album ever by anybody, but that's just me. <laughs> oh, what do you want to go there? Anyways, I uh, have like the little house. What Sean's on the got. I've got the re the remastered. I mean the remixed uh, cover. I don't know. You guys like the new artwork? What do you think? No, I think it needs to be green. I agree, but it I mean, is rare. It's, it's nice looking, but it just seems wrong. You mean this one? Yeah, this is my original. Needed that. something on the cover, but that's the right. remaster remix has to keep intact the, the original. I think this would have looked nice if it was just all done up in some greens. With well, look at it this accents. way: it was Roger Dean's idea. If you like what Roger Dean did before, well, Roger Dean has you know the. Uh, I'm just the, saying he had he pleases you know <laughs> he had the the final say and he yeah, did he what did. he did. I it's got like to meet him. It's like when Rush re released those reissues over the last couple of years of. Uh, you know, hemispheres and permanent waves and farewell to kings with completely different album covers. I'm like, you can't do that. I mean, yeah, it's like, just... yeah, but I figured out why it happened because they want they don't want people to get confused on what covers which. I guess, and they want people to keep all their old ones too. If we... they saw the old artwork, they might not buy it. They might think, oh, well, well, it's just the original. I would have gotten it regardless. Well, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Any fan would know that, and he's right. But you know, Led Zeppelin did the same thing. Jimmy Page put the uh, the negative, the positive and negative on outside, and some people gave, gave him heck. Why did you do that? But he wanted for that same reason was to make sure you knew that was an expanded version, yeah. and that's the only way you can separate them too from the shelf, perhaps, or show the, on online. When you know, see online, all you see is a picture. You don't show have the, the back, detail. Show the back again, Rick. Show the back again. Yeah, see that? Look at this. Okay. This this is the LP. You've got you've got the Joe Gasper. Yeah, I got a couple versions of this, though, so actually. Yeah. Cool. Interesting stuff. Okay. I think we've all probably bought that album five or six times over the years. Uh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, I have I have five versions of it. <sighs> There's certain Another bands where I, I have bought these albums so many times over the years. Yes. Rush, Jethro Tull, Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin. It's like it gets to a point where, like, how many more times am I going to keep buying these? Gentle Giant. Yep. Like, yeah, when you buy a box set, you, you end up with two hundred dollars worth of CDs. You can you can make money on. It. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it's working okay, out, especially guys. with Crimson. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so we got, so we got too close to the edges so far. This is number yeah. one. My number one. Is it my turn? Yep. Yeah, you already did. That's now okay. your turn. I'm going to pull a Pardo and. Uh, Oh, he's doing a tie. Look at that. And the oh, reason I'm the that. reason I'm, I'm doing this for a reason. Here's the reason. Bill Burford didn't even play Close the Edge song until he got into this band. Right. He he just picked, like they were saying, stitch and paste and all that. He finally got to play it on this tour. This movie was made September 9th, 1989, at Mountain View Shoreline. I was in that audience. This means a lot to me because I was there and I got to see it. And it was a phenomenal night. It was pay-per-view and that's how come it's on DVD. And uh, those are my number one. Cool. Close to the mm -hmm. Edge and uh, Anderson Burford, Wakeman Howe. An evening, of, with, an evening of Yes Music Plus, it's called. Yeah, well, that was the highlight of that tour was seeing Bruford play Close to the Edge. Oh, yeah. I mean, and just, I, seeing I just like in heaven. It hadn't been played seriously since 1977. So it was a 12 year wait that seemed like an eternity, I'm sure. In hindsight, it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> right. So for my number one, well, of course, let's just fess up and admit that the beguiling island rhythms of Tikwa is Bill's greatest moment. Uh, are you going to get a bucket to puke in there? 
Um, Wrong album. <laughs> I grabbed all no, traps on earth. Don't 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 get up on my behalf. <laughs> I grabbed all traps on earth by mistake, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, I'm going to go with "Close to the Edge," number one, of course, and "Siberian Katru." That's the tune I just think is one the greatest yes tune with Bill Bruford on it, hands down. Yeah, uh, that is my favorite yes song of all time. You know, "Close to the Edge" is is probably my number two but siberian control man what a great great yeah, they just never wrote one like that again and it, you know it had a lot right. of bill's input you know i'm glad they didn't write son of siberian control honestly but it just never came even close you know right. these it's kind of little motifs that you know you know steve had a way of like sequencing things in octaves you know you start down low and then you move it up at the next one and finally you're way up at the top of the neck he can, didn't do that a whole lot later, but that was a, a hallmark of a lot of his 70s stuff. Machine Messiah is another example where he <clears throat> yep. goes to the octaves real quick. So And so, Wakeman's yeah. uh, Mellotron work in that song is just fantastic. Great stuff. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's my choice as well. Um, and I do want to mention, I saw the uh, Wake, Anderson Wakeman Bluford Howe tour at Madison Square Garden. Terrific. Nice. Absolutely terrific. Um, yeah, this is my number one. It's got to be. Um, his swan song in the band and uh three great tracks classic tracks uh the whole band is on fire here album sounds terrific composition wise it's all absolutely perfect um this was this was the the no-brainer of my list when i was putting this list together and i had like 15 albums all listed i said all right number one boom now to figure out the rest of it right so there's this and then there's everything that comes to follow but uh yeah, a lot of great stuff here. Uh, anybody have any uh, honorable mentions you want to throw out? Well, I did want to mention one thing about this one. The re the reissue of this, it's a little bigger than a regular CD. You do get Vultures in the city, which is really cool, and you can't get it anywhere else. And it's got a lot of extras and bonuses stuff. Well, I just want to remind the people that if you haven't seen Genesis Live 1976, uh, the, uh, a Bill playing with Bill, uh, in the beginning of the, you know, the first time him stepping up to the microphone, being the front man, it's worth seeing. it. You'll be impressed how he did it, and you'll be impressed about Phil doing some Peter Gabriel vocal, uh, which he does a very good job live. So, oh yeah, I, I just want to throw it out there. And also, I want to just do, and out of respect for my our buddy Pete, I want to say thank you to all those who had we had we showed a video last time, and it took a while to upload. And people stayed up at late at midnight to watch the film. And we want to say thank you for the dedication. That's awesome. It goes to show you a great testimony about this channel and what we do of full music. And that's just a credit to Pete's work. And I just want to say, wow, what great, great viewers we have that could sit there, wait, and do this upload and, and uh, sit through that. And that was awesome. We, I don't want to take it lightly. That was really impressive. And we want to thank you for that. Yeah, we have we have some dedicated viewers. I will say that, and it's going to happen again tonight because it always seems to happen at the later shows we do, and the longer shows. And this one is uh, you know an hour and forty five minutes here. So uh, yeah, for whatever reason, the file takes forever to upload, and YouTube sure. takes forever, and it's just annoying. Like we have like 50, 75, 100 people waiting, and they waited like over an hour, and I was like, they sat in that chat room and just talked amongst each other, and I was like. Whew, I'm, I'm amazed. Do you I, find I, I, some I days, bed. Do you find some days it renders faster than others? Yeah, and I find like early in the day, like when I do my morning shoots. What, they, they go what I've the found computer. is I restart my computer twice. I don't just turn it off. I hit restart, and that kind of clears out all the RAM, and then it goes pretty quick. So okay, maybe I'll try that tonight just, just for the shot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have hey, an honorable mention before we go to. You. Yeah, do it. Yep. Gordian not emergent. That's a good one. One of the last things that Bill did in a prog sense with uh, the late Sean Malone on bass and J Jason Goldbill, Goldbill, and uh, Gordy Knott, really great band, and Bruford is just on fire on this one. Yeah, and Hackett guests on that, I think, on a couple yeah, tracks. Too. Songs like really, I didn't know that. Yeah. Hey, Pete, do you mind if I mention what's coming up on my? Uh... Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, I think you all might know that I have a talk show that chat where i chat with a lot of prog rock folks and coming up this weekend on saturday night at 10 p.m eastern i'm chatting with Derek shulman from general giant about that new stephen wilson remix of freehand 
and we'll be sure to talk about a lot of other stuff too. So please come by and check it out. Uh, it's backslash S O A L night live soul night live. And uh, we did an excellent history of King Crimson 1969 through 74 last weekend with Henry Potts and Emmerich Leroy that I think y'all will enjoy. I, I wasn't sure we could uncover anything that hasn't already been said because, you know, Sid Smith really said it all in his amazing biography that I suggest you all get if you haven't got it yet. But uh, it was a, our show was like a nice two hour footnote to that. And I, I think we did uncover some new things that maybe you haven't heard elsewhere or heard quite like that. So please, yeah, come I on. I love right. your show. I love your show so much. Well, I love you guys. Thank you. I have one thing to ask. Yep. It's really, really humbling, but uh, I have a YouTube channel. It's called Rand Kelly. It's his ugly face on I'm right in that circle. You can see me really easy. I really need a thousand subscribers so I can go go live with YouTube. They demand that you have a thousand and I haven't hit 500 yet. If anybody out there wants to help me out, but just to, you subscribe, it doesn't cost you a dime and uh, I sure appreciate it. So, well, yeah, we call it a, oh, random, wow. a random act of kindness. By <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. Okay. Yeah, that was it. a good one, Sean. That is a good one. Sean's good. Sean's got some good one-liners. So. Yeah. <laughs> Before we go, I want to do one honorable mention because none of us had it in our lists. Uh, that bad boy that's sitting right behind uh, Rand's left shoulder, I think. Starless mm -hmm. and Bible, Bible Black did not make my list, but uh, I really wanted to squeeze it in there. But that's probably. It's my number 11, I guess, for me. Yeah, that's actually the Starless box set, but it's on there. Yeah. Uh, I have the regular one if you want me to show them. I mean, Fracture alone is worth getting that album for. I mean, that's yeah. like the pinnacle of that era, I think. You know, it's a, lot of, a lot of improv stuff on there. There's some material drawn from live performances, but uh, it's, it's awesome, too. Yeah, there we go. This is the actual album. Yeah, this is really good. It's got the 5.1 on it and stuff, but this goes like totally obsolete because of that yeah. so i've got like 200 dollars worth of king crimson music i don't even need to keep hey ebay <laughs> there you go so everybody everybody knows who's having a king crimson sale That's local right. record store okay. sub to rand's youtube channel and get <laughs> some of his Please, old i'd stuff. appreciate it i really would i, I want to do some live i want to do some live i don't know why youtube says you have to have a thousand but there must be a reason just the love you youtube you love you <laughs> they have some weird uh, policies but uh I, they I, act like you don't exist until you get a thousand subscribers in a lot of ways like they just don't think you're that serious right. and they, even then when you get to a thousand they don't really do a lot for you yeah so you gotta gotta get way past that for it does get better though i don't care about the money i just want to be able to turn it on yeah. again you can't go live without a thousand yeah right. yeah it's no, true well. It's all right. All right, everybody. There you have it. Uh, whew, epic show tonight. Um, favorite Bill Bruford moments. So uh, put yours in the comments below, your top five, your top 10. Again, albums, songs, live albums, performances you've seen in person, whatever. Uh, this is all about uh, some love for Bill Bruford. And uh, I think we hit on a lot of the really important albums and songs and all that kind of stuff. So uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube. All, all the damn all time. The damn time. time for Rick Labonte, Rand Kelly, and Sean Tonar, IMP Pardo. Good night, everybody. See you tomorrow morning with another edition of Classic Album Rewind and Thursday, The Monsters Den, Friday morning with Martin Popoff at the Fun House. And, uh, and then hopefully everybody has a great weekend. And we'll see you all next week, bright and early, well, not actually in the evening, for the Hudson Valley Squares. So take care, everybody. Have a good one. Take care. <laughs>